Hello, everyone uh, who's here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Amy Kropel, and I am the director of the University of Florida's Jean Monnet Center of Excellence and the Center for European Studies. The UF uh, JMCE is funded by the European Commission's Erasmus Plus program and is part of the JM in the US network, a network of US Jean Monnet centers and programs. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's discussion will be recorded and available on the UFJMCE website. We will have a Q&A session following the presentation, and all participants can submit questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screens. Uh, so again, thank you all of you for joining us today. We're here to discuss legislating anti-racism in the EU and the US. This panel is part of our JMCE series, the EU in the News, which examines pressing issues that face both the EU and the US, with topics ranging from preparing for the next pandemic to gender pay gaps and representation in the financial sector. For details on the other panels in the series, you can visit our website, which is simply jmce.ufl.edu. Today, our panel includes Dr. Sharon Austin, who is Professor of Political Science at the University of Florida. She works on African-American political behavior and in particular, African-American women's political behavior. We also have Dr. Silvia Rodriguez Maceo, principal researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, where her current work focuses on the politics of anti-racism in Europe and Latin America. And Karen Taylor, who is chair of the European Network Against Racism, the only pan-European network combining racial equality advocacy with building a strong network of anti-racist organizations across Europe. She is also the director of the policy and advocacy at Each One Teach One. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand the discussion over to Dr. Rodriguez. Following Dr. Rodriguez, uh, we will see if uh, Karen Taylor is able to speak with us and then go to Sharon Austin for the view from the US. So we'll be a little flexible with who goes when, but why don't we go ahead and start with you, uh, Dr. Maceo. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon from, from Coimbra in Portugal. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much to the Jean Monnet Center. Uh, so I'm going to read my presentation so I can keep uh, um, track of the time. I hope I don't pass the 15 minutes, maybe a couple of minutes more, but uh, I try to, to adjust to the, to the time that I was assigned. Okay, so my intervention today locates the debate about law and anti-racism in the European Union within its contemporary history since the mid-1980s. A Union for Equality, EU Anti-Racist Action Plan 2020-2025, belongs to this trajectory that in the past had as a landmark the approval of the Race Equality Directive in 2000. Despite relevant changes in the understanding of racism and its historical roots, a Union of Equality does not bring about fundamental changes in, the relation to previous, uh, in relation to previous frameworks. The acknowledgement of the colonial roots of racism and its legacies, the more explicit understanding of racism as systematic, and the recognition of the need to tackle the structural racism largely results from the pressure of anti-racist grassroots organizations as movements and critical scholarship, like the timid expansion of critical race theory, for instance, in Europe, very, very timid, I would say. However, we need to ask what has been really acknowledged is there an agenda for transformative change that overcomes the individual versus structural understanding of racism? An agenda that aims to push states towards processes of policy change? Or despite those acknowledgements, the solutions remain the same? In this context, I, I would like to highlight two interrelated issues. One, how the history of the debates about the law and races in the European Union since the mid-1980s and the approval of this racial equality directive show the investment in a mythical and exceptional identity of Europe that in terms of the law is simplified by what Peter Fitzpatrick named as the mythology of modern law. And the second issue is that modern law and in particular criminal law are constitutive of the modern individual. And this is a racial process, or in other words, the modern individual, the subject of rights and duties, has been racially constituted. For instance, like within the divide between Europeanness and non-Europeanness. 
In this sense, anti-discrimination legislation is based, on, is based on the premise that racism is an eventual deviation in the form of behaviors and beliefs from the principle, a deviation from the principle of equal treatment. The acknowledgement of a structural racism has not fundamentally challenged this presumption, even if the, I think it's very important that this kind of vocabulary has entered uh, the European Union frameworks. Regarding the first issue, I contend that states and societies that have been historically built upon modern colonial violence and racial enslavement claim a substantial non-racist or an anti-racist identity and culture, while at the same time investing in public policies and legislation that effectively reproduce institutional racism and coloniality. The embracing of the need for a specific legislation to combat racial discrimination in the European Union is part of proactively embracing this anti-racist uh, identity. From the 1980s, the catalyst, uh, the catalyst to take more decisive uh, anti-discrimination legislation and a comprehensive European framework have been the ever-present concern and realities of the rise of the extreme right and related hate speech and hate crime and also the need to regulate the inclusion of mostly extra communitarian immigrant peoples in the different life spheres and, spheres and especially in the labor market. The predominant narrative within this context has been that of adaptation to new realities defined by an unprecedented diversity that erased, uh, but this, this perspective has erased colonial histories from the processes of migration and focused on the idea of the true racist a sort of deviant citizen that makes democracy vulnerable to racism. In sum, the evidence of the rise of widespread racism and xenophobia in each of the European countries has been usually interpreted through the framework of challenges of uh, an increasing diverse society, of Europe experiencing an unprecedented cultural shock, and the acknowledgement of uh, institutionalized racism, and the acknowledgement of institutionalized racism has not usually pushed, pushed for a uh, reconsideration of public policies and legislations. I will give some, some examples. For instance, the Aliens Act in Spain that established the detention centers for foreigners or centros de internamiento de extranjeros. Legislation and public policies on citizen and internal security, articles in the in criminal uh, procedure code, for instance, in Portugal, that criminalize racialized persons and specific neighborhoods and favor racial profiling and police harassment or policy decisions in the areas of housing and education that continue to reproduce segregation. The understanding continues to be centered on preventing discriminatory attitudes, behaviors, but based on prejudices that even acknowledging its embeddedness in institutions are seen as a problem of insufficient training or awareness raises. And I think this is a common place regarding law enforcement institutions or police institutions. They focus on training while the policies and regulations concerning security and police activity remain largely unchanged. This leads me to the second issue, the perpetuation of an understanding of races as an individual deviation. Intentionality, the most potent dimension of liberal individuality, reinforces the, uh, the episodic nature of, of discrimination and the operationaliz op operationalization of categories introduced in the legislation, such as the notion of indirect discrimination or the shifting of the burden of proof towards the respondent have proved insufficient to counter the individual versus institutional divide. Indirect discrimination is seen as a notion that allows to tackle discrimination beyond the proof of individual intentionality, considering instead the actual results of equal treatment. I'm following here er Erica Howard's book, uh, Work in 2007. That is, it allows to avoid people using natural provision or rules to circumvent the prohibition of, di of direct discrimination. And it rests on a more substantive notion of equality. However, indirect discrimination may be considered acceptable if there is proof of an objective legitimate end. Uh, for that discrimination. Some examples, landmark decisions by the uh, European Court of Human Rights, such as the case uh, of DH and other versus Czech Republic in 2007, held that disproportion the disproportionate assignment of Roma children to so-called special schools without an objective and reasonable justification amounted to indirect uh, discrimination. 
However, although more, more research is needed in this area, uh, I reckon that my research in the Portuguese context demonstrated that inter international and European case law has not informed national jurisprudence. Another important question regarding, for instance, anti-Roma racism is that the strategic litigation has focused on so-called Eastern European countries that have also informed ideas about institutional racism and state responsibility that reinforce a divide between so-called Western and uh, Eastern European member states regarding the treatment of Roma peoples. For instance, looking at cases of school segregation of Roma students in Portugal, and I have to say that legislation in Portugal regarding uh, anti-discrimination in related to, to race are both administrative and criminal, okay? And cases of uh, school segregation are administrative, uh, is under administrative law, is not criminal, okay? Uh, so it's uh, cases of, of uh, segregation, for instance, are considered as an administrative offense, okay? Punished by a, a fine, a fine. Okay. Um, so, looking at these cases of school segregation of Roma students in Portugal, we need to critically analyze how public policies or institutional decisions are grounded on a specific state rationales, such as integration and deficit models regarding racialized peoples. These cases of segregation have been commonly interpreted as a form of integration or adaptation to a culture of schooling that Roma families lack, are lacking. So that we like segregating you know, uh, Roma students is like a, a way of integrating these pupils in the schools due to all these deficits and, and, fun, and um, lack of, of culture of schooling in, in Roma peoples. Um, school segregation cases reveal the racialized normalcy of democratic institutions at work, let's say a public school, a city council, or an equality body. And they call for an understanding of institutional races, not so much as a type of races, what institutions do versus what individuals do, but as an example of the embeddedness of coloniality in democracy. In this context, the law normalizes exceptional regulations in the name of integration, uh, so segregation, in the name of integration, segregation is allowed for citizens that are regarded by law and public policy as an exception to the democratic uh, society. And I'm going to end that now with another common issue also related to this discussion uh, about the debate of, of the burden of proof, that is the use of statistical data that was also discussed in this uh, decision by the European Court of, of Human Rights in 2007 or the use of rigorous studies on the effects of public decision-making regarding uh, racism. However, as we know, European Union member states continue to refuse to uh, the, system, um, the systematic gathering of equality data based on racial origin. Despite the recommendations by the European Union agencies, such as the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, for instance, for, for years, this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, currently, none of the member states, to my knowledge, um, gather this data. And the UK was the only country, to my knowledge, that, that used to do that. The inclusion of, a, for instance, in Portugal, the question, uh, the inclusion of a question of self-identification based on ethnicity and racial origin in the census, the last census that was in 2021, has, uh, what has been a key demand of many anti-racist organizations of movements. And in Portugal, these demands led to the constitution of an ad hoc working group in 2018 and 2019 that recommended the inclusion of a question on ethno racial self identification in the census. But the Portuguese Statistics Office rejected the proposal. And I know that, for instance, in other countries like Spain, this is an ongoing mobilization, okay? But it's been unfruitful uh, so far. In this context, the prohibition of racial discrimination in legal provisions and the punishment and prevention, uh, prevention framework that sustain them operate within the constraints of individual intentionality and the persisting circumstances of racialized people, their cultural backwardness or the idea that they, are, they, they hold undemocratic ideologies or mindsets, uh, their involvement in Ill illegal economies and criminal activities, etc. I think this is crucial to understand, for instance, the shortcomings of criminal law regarding cases of police brutality, harassment, and racial profiling. My research in the Portuguese context showed that the qualification of acts of aggression 
as racially motivated depends on the evaluation of individual's intentionality. I mean, this is not like a, <laughs> any spectacular key finding. It has to do, of course, with the rationale of, of criminal law. So the proof, that is the proof of a direct connection between racist beliefs and actions. For instance, this is, was recurrent, you know, when, when, uh, when police officers were held accountable, you know, regarding uh, aggression against, uh, most, uh, for instance, black, black population or, or Roma population. And, mo and generally, this, this, this connection between racist beliefs and actions is mostly based on the juridical interpretation of racist slurs. But usually, of course, this understanding disconnects actions taken by police officers from the routine policing activities that follow a specific policies and regulations. For instance, how policing is spatially organized and how specific forms of policing are applied to neighborhoods with a majority of black and Roma population. So in this context, the focus on, again, I mean, what, what I think we need to move on is, I'm not saying like training is not important, but I think the insistent usually on, on the, the training, you know, training police officers, training police officers to uh, overcome the stereotypes. Um, I mean, it's, it's, they, they are, they're not going really to change, to change the, the reality. So I think that the focus on training and, and preventing prejudice attitudes of police officers, I think that continue to deviate from the key issue at hand, criminalization that disproportionately affect Black, Roma, Arab, and other racialized peoples in Europe. That's it. Thank you. I hope I did not pass the time. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to make sure. Oh, I think we've we've lost Karen Taylor. So, OK, so Sharon, let's go and we'll see if Karen can make it back. OK, so I have a PowerPoint presentation that I, I want to share. Um, so today I mostly want to talk about just race uh, in France because I teach a study abroad class uh, called African Americans in Paris and over the course of the years I started teaching that class in 2014. Um, I've learned so much about the way that race is, is perceived in France and also just in Europe generally. Um, so I wanted to talk about both France and Britain, but in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about France based on some of the things that I teach and things that I've learned over the years. So this gives you like a brief outline of what I'll talk about uh, in my presentation, just the way that Europeans perceive race um, and also just the idea or the stereotype. The common belief is that in Europe, there's a society of color blindness. And now we know that that's certainly not true. But for the longest time, that's what a lot of people thought, especially about France. Um, to, I wanna talk about some of the information that I include in the class and um, the Center for European Studies has been very supportive of this class over the years um, about uh, African-Americans who left America and became expatriates. They moved to France, mostly um, before the modern civil rights movement. But even in recent years, uh, I found a really interesting book that I wanna talk a little bit about, about an African-American woman who had said that if Donald Trump were elected president in 2016, she would leave America. And he was elected, as you know, and she left and she moved to France. So I wanna talk about her also as, as an example of one of the more recent um, African-Americans who moved uh, to France because they didn't like the racial climate here in America. And so really the, the stereotype about French race re relations, but also the truth. So the truth versus the myths about race in France. And then the global Black Lives Matter movement, which has had a huge impact on some of the things that you're seeing in both America and also in, in uh, Europe, in terms of them attempting to address racial issues, especially in Europe that they never want to talk about. And the same is tr true here in the US. A lot of that is because of the death of George Floyd in 2020 and a lot of um, initiatives that have occurred since then. So I wanna end by just talking a little bit about the union of equality and to give you some questions, some things to think about maybe for Q and A. So um, as far as the European anti-racism action plan that I read, um, which covers the years from 2020 to 2025, I found a really interesting quote that was made by a member of the European Parliament on June 17th of 2020, in which he talked about something that at the time in 2020 was obvious, but in the past people in, in France and also in Europe were, were kind of in denial about. And he said, we need to talk about racism and we need to act. 
it is always uh, possible to change direction if there is a will to do so. I'm glad to live in a society that condemns racism, but we should not stop there. The motto of our European Union is united in diversity. Our task is to live up to these words and to fulfill their meaning. So it really is interesting that he said we need to talk about racism because for so long, nobody wants to talk about racism um, in America, or in Europe or anywhere else. So these are examples of people that I talk about in my class who were very famous uh, individuals who left America and moved to Europe and later had very successful careers. The woman over on your, the far left is Josephine Baker, an international superstar. They recently um, placed an honor uh, of her in the Pantheon when she's the first black woman to ever had to have received that type of honor. The person in the center is the author Richard Wright. Uh, who left America because of American racism. He's the author of books like Black Boy, Native Son. And the man over to the far right is James Baldwin, who also left America and moved to France for several years. Uh, he came back to America to be involved in the modern civil rights movement, especially the March on Washington in 1963. And then after that, he went uh, back to France. So even though they left America, they never really gave up their allegiance uh, to America. They were always still very much involved in the fight for racial justice in America, but the climate in America was so harsh that they felt it would be better to live somewhere else. But in recent years, uh, some African-Americans have left America again because of the racial climate uh, in a lot of cities, the race racial situation in 2020, but even before then, the many protests that have taken place since 2020, the issues of policing in minority communities, other types of issues uh, involving race in minorities communities, especially in black communities. So this is a really interesting book uh, written by a woman who's a journalist and a real estate agent named Audrey Edwards. It's called American Runaway, Black and Free in Paris in the Trump Years. And as I mentioned, she was someone who said that if Donald Trump was elected, she would leave. And so indeed she did and she went to France. So I wanna show you a brief clip, uh, which is only about, I guess, less than two minutes in which she talks about her book. And the, this is a uh, picture of the book uh, and the reason that she chose to leave America. And it's the, uh, um, this is a interview that's hosted by a woman named Ricky Stevenson. If you ever get a chance to go to Paris, you should really try to do one of the Black Paris tours. And Ricky Stevenson um, has her own tour company and she's the person that you're gonna see who's moderating this interview, but she uh, has a really, really good um, Black Paris tour. As a matter of fact, she has several. So I'll just show you this brief clip. Oops, <laughs> let me see, is the volume okay? Okay, let me turn up the volume. I'll bet it'll be too loud, but let's see. It doesn't seem to be working, Sharon. Oh, okay, you can't hear it? Uh, okay. I, I cannot hear it. What you might do is um, afterwards put the link in the yeah. chat and I can send it to all of the participants. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I, I might have even forgotten to share the sound. But anyway, it's it's really just a brief interview in which she talks about her book. Let me go back to the presentation. And she talks about just the climate in America. And in the book, she talks about the fact that she didn't feel safe in America. And she talked to a lot of other African-Americans who were really afraid of what Donald Trump would do. And then after he actually um, was inaugurated, um, it was she said it was even worse than she even imagined. She had already left uh, shortly after he was elected. Um, but after he actually was in office and she saw the different things that were happening during the four years he was in office, she it pretty much confirmed what she already had suspected was that um, racial relations would get much worse. So that's a really interesting book uh, if you're interested um, in reading it. All right, so in France, um, it's been said that there's the myth of a colorblind France. And a lot of French people um, you know, talk about the fact that race in, in France is not considered to be as harsh as race in America. And if you're interested in finding a documentary um, by the same title, you can see this film, Myth of a Colorblind France, which was recently um, created. I'm not sure who the filmmaker is, um, but it talks a lot about the stereotypes that people have about race in, in France. So really, um, African-Americans, as I mentioned, who were the expatriates who went to Paris and other cities in Europe, 
um, left, left and went there. And they said that in Paris, they were treated much better than they were in America. And the reason for that was because African-Americans at the time, especially around the turn of the century and in the 1920s, which was the height of the jazz age uh, in the period before World War II, they were seen as being exotic. So people like Josephine Baker, who was born in East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, moved to Paris because when she was a little girl, she witnessed the East St. Louis race riots and other things happened to her when she was a young uh, child. And she went to Paris when she was only 16 to work as a dancer and later achieved international fame. She also worked uh, in the war effort in World War II for France as sort of an undercover spy. She was such a famous entertainer at the time that she was able to travel to different countries pretending to be performing, but actually she was getting information that she was using to try to um, assist the French. But African-Americans were viewed in a different light from other people of African descent. And the belief was that African-Americans who went to Paris, first of all, most of them had um, different types of talents that they couldn't really um, get the uh, support for in America that they could get support for in France. So they were seen as being exotic. They were musicians and dancers. Um, and so in some ways, a lot of people believe that African-Americans weren't treated as badly as Black people from other countries. But France has always had a really tense relationship with Algeria, uh, which and many people who are Algerians who are North Africans um, have been treated very badly throughout French history. They've been perceived as being barbaric. Um, and you know there were stereotypes about them as being disease written. Um, they were seen as being the type of people who couldn't really assimilate into French culture. So these are people who were treated really, really badly. Even James Baldwin spoke out about the treatment of Algerians and he invited other people like Richard Wright and other uh, African-Americans to speak out as well because he witnessed the beating of an Algerian man by the police and he wanted other black people to say something about these people being treated this badly and very few people did because the African-American expatriates were afraid that if they said anything to speak out against the violence directed at Algerians then the same violence would be directed at them or they might have to leave and they didn't want to come back to America. Um, in some cases, and even today, Algerians have been discriminated against in employment and just in, ge in general, they faced all kinds of discrimination. Um, in 1962, Algeria declared its independence uh, after 132 years of French occupation, there was an Algerian war that took place from 1954 to 1962. So those are just some of the tensions between the French and the Algerians. Uh, and even now when you, I mean, the one thing that I noticed the first time that I went to Paris is it's very diverse and there are a lot of people of color there, but there still are a lot of tensions because of the immigration issue, um, not just in Paris, but in, in not just in France, but in other European countries as well, because everyone doesn't welcome Welcome uh, immigrants. And so the same types of issues that we're dealing with here in America with the scapegoating of immigrants, the same thing occurs uh, in Europe as well. Also, France, to my surprise, when I first started studying um, France and Paris, uh, they don't keep records of racial demographics. And the problem with that is that in America, you know, you have an abundance of census data that tells you about the black populations or you know, racial populations in various communities and various states. You have demographics that give you information about poverty and the differences between white poverty, black poverty, Hispanic poverty, Asian poverty. They don't keep those kinds of records in France. And the belief is because of the idea that they really do believe that they have such a colorblind society that they don't distinguish race, they don't need to. Um, but we now know that that certainly isn't true, but that but they don't really record racial demographics in the same way um, that we do. And that's another reason why you can't really prove that racism exists unless something really uh, egregious takes place because you don't have that data to show that there are different disparities um, among people of different races. Um, and then also as far as hate speech, um, mostly in France, they focus on hate speech rather than issues involving discrimination because those issues involving discrimination such as in employment, housing and in other types of discrimination tend to have racial disparities. And you, if they kept a, a racial record of that, they probably would see that there were different, the same types of divisions that we have here um, the same type of differences in pay along racial lines with um, white people making more than black people, the same types of disparities in housing with people of color being more likely to live in substandard um, housing or more likely to live in poorer communities. Those problems exist there, but rather than focusing on looking at those types of issues, they focus on hate speech. Um, and in some cases, hate speech, of course, has a racial connotation, but it isn't the same. It's not the same in the sense that if someone says something to you, 
you know, you can't really say that that's an example of racism unless they say something that's really, really horrible. But if you have concrete data on racial disparities and employment and housing and pay and those types of things, then you would be able to prove racism. And I think a lot of people believe that in France, they just don't want to acknowledge that there's any type of real racism there and that those racial disparities um, uh, exist. And so now you're hearing different types of discussions about the anti-racism efforts that are taking place in Europe. But in the past, this is something that's new because in the past, France has intentionally avoided uh, any type of race conscious policy. So for example, in America, there's so much of a controversy over affirmative action in different types of initiatives that we have here to try to benefit people who are disadvantaged, culturally and historically disadvantaged, which usually tends to be um, people of color in, in many cases. They don't have those types of race conscious policies um, in France that are spe specifically designed to try to benefit of any, any group of any particular race or ethnicity. Um, but there are initiatives there that are designed to benefit disadvantaged persons, but they're not said to be race conscious policies. They don't really uh, mention race, even though in some sense, even if they don't mention race and they're not race conscious, in some cases, they still nevertheless benefit people who are disadvantaged, who also tend to be people of color, like the educational priority zones uh, initiatives. Um, that provides additional funds to disadvantaged school districts. And many of these disadvantaged schools, I guess the kids that attend these schools tend to be children of color, tends to be uh, immigrant children or the children of immigrants. Uh, and then on May 25th, 2020, as many of us know, um, a very significant event occurred when Officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis held his knee on George Floyd's neck. And it was recorded, it went viral. Uh, he held his knee there for almost nine minutes. It was said that that was one of the things that contributed to George Floyd's murder. Other officers stood around and watched. I think many of us have seen the footage of that over and over again. And so because that was something that was recorded, this was something that went viral and it also went global. It was a huge issue here in America, but also it was a huge issue all around the world because finally people in countries like Europe had to say, say something and had to acknowledge that there were racial problems there and that there was racism there. Um, in Paris, there were a number of protests in a number of other French cities and cities all over Europe. There were a number of different protests. Some of these protests um, co consisted of thousands of people who were really frustrated, not because of what they saw in the video, that was only a part of it, but also because of other incidents of racism that they had witnessed in their countries that had never really been acknowledged before, uh, including in Paris on June 2nd, 2020, when they were talking about um, George Floyd, this was in the aftermath of his death, approximately 20,000 people participated in a Black Lives Matter protest there um, to demand justice for another young Black man who was killed on the basis uh, or because of police brutality there. They had not really gotten, um, I guess his family had not gotten the justice that they should have. So really a lot of people started thinking about other types of situations in which people of color, especially men of color, have been abused or have been murdered. Um, and they started to bring attention to that and talk about racism. So for the first time you saw people really talking about racism really openly, openly and also protesting it. So the, um, the murder of George Floyd had a significant impact all around the world uh, in making it so that people had to talk about race. You could no longer ignore it. You could no longer be in denial about it. Uh, and then also you could look at this um, link on your own. It talks about one of the protests in France uh, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, in which they were bringing attention to other men of color who also had been abused and also had been murdered. So now we're uh, now seeking a society in which there's more equality or a union of equality in which uh, people talk about race, people really come up with specific ways to try to address racial issues. And so now you're beginning to see that um, in Europe and you're beginning to see more discussions of race in America as well. But I guess the main question is, is Europe and also in America, are we serious about addressing racism? Or is this just something that's temporary simply because we saw this horrible video of what happened to George Floyd? In America, there were all types of efforts, even on our very own campus, there were different efforts. People were making statements condemning racism, um, and you'd never really seen anything on, on such a massive scale before, at least I had never seen anything like that before. But is this is going to be something that's going to be, continue, these anti-racism efforts, or is this just something that happened as a result of the George Floyd murder, and then in time, you know, we'll go back to doing things just as we did before, and pretty much trying to avoid racial issues. 
So I just wanted to stop there. I wanted to just give you all kind of like a history about race in France and the way that um, race has been perceived in Europe. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at last update, our last guest is trying to get off the train somewhere. Um, hopefully she will be able to join us. But what I'd like to do is um, just pose some questions to both of you, maybe. Uh, you'll take it from, from different perspectives based on your background. But Dr. Maceo, when you were speaking, one of the, the things that you differentiated between was a focus on changing attitudes uh, and maybe even the way that individuals act and the institutions in which some of the institutionalized racism is embedded and efforts to change those more structural components um, that feed into or facilitate uh, lived racism, right? The experience of racism, which is, is also part of what occurs in the United States and part of what is being challenged in part by the Black Lives, Ladder, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Although I don't know that that differentiation is made as explicitly as it could be. And so I'd like to ask you both to, to think about either actions that have been taken or actions that perhaps could be taken to shift that, that balance, right? So that we're not focused on individuals changing hearts and minds, changing attitudes, um, growing recognition of microaggressions or outright racism, but rather trying to change those structures that facilitate or or allow for racism to flourish despite changing attitudes in some cases. Um, we can start with you, Dr. Maceo, and then we'll go to you, Dr. Austin. Well, yeah, this is like the uh, yeah the the ten million <laughs> euros question, no? Like, then this is the fight, no? I think like. For instance, the example that I was uh, giving about the focus on training, no? this is, is, is an ongoing, it's, it's always the same solutions. So, I may, well, I'm going to give an example that I think it's uh, it's been very, um, very central in the last years and in the last months, even in Portugal, that I think it's uh, it's common to many European countries, and it has to do also with this, because I think it's very interesting to connect this uh, focus on on the individual and, and that and how this individual is very much uh, linked to an idea of what is the racist individual that is again this kind of extreme right you know that of course has a very specific history uh in europe i mean not only in europe but of course you know it has to do also with how historically europe has interpreted uh the nazi regime and the holocaust okay and the disconnection in these interpretations from from colonialists i think that that is a very i know it's very broad but i think it's very important but I want to give a very specific example that is re regarding the ongoing uh, uh, that Sharon also has, has been speaking about, the question of, of police brutality and aggression and harassment. Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the uh, demonstrations, the political organization against police brutality has been ongoing uh, for many, many years. Uh, for instance, even in, in, in Portugal, you know. Um, demonstrations, but of course, you know, like Black Lives Matters gave this um, a kind of 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 a, of a global language and the idea that we need to connect anti-blackness beyond the, the states. And I think that was important. But of course, the struggles were going on. But what I want to give the example that within this discussion, there is at the same time a very very uh, strong discussion about. And in Portugal, they, they speak about, about this issue like this, that the infiltration of extreme right in the police, uh, uh, in the in police institutions, okay? So what, what is, what, what is uh, this is an example that I think is very interesting because even, of course, I think it's very important to analyze that and historically why, and this is not a surprise, we know, I mean, because what police institutions mean, what the job they do, why there is a constant presence of extreme right uh, uh, police officers, okay? But the problematic is that the focus on that is again, and then again, the question of training, you know. And for instance, what is very interesting is that 
for instance, in the last months, there has been a huge debate in Portugal about this, which is recurrent, it's cyclical, okay? But uh, for instance, discovery of uh, how there has been research, discoveries that, that research of um, like uh, uh, the use of, by police officers, the use of social media, chat they have, you know, and how they are uh, all the time, you know, like uh, being explicit, you know, with racist claims, uh, uh, etc. At the same time that you have so there is there has been this discussion, even very strong in the parliament, you know, like even even upper level, what is going on with the police, etc. And the same time, you know, denying, of course, police uh, uh, high rank police officer, you know, there are some individuals, but this is not an institutional issue. At the same time, very important uh, security, urban security, public policies have been approved and they're going to you know to be implemented. Which again, they are repeating all these criminalizations, all these focus, for instance, and for instance, in Portugal, we have copied a lot of uh, public policies regarding education, regarding a specific neighborhoods from France, actually. For instance, the use of these uh, sensitive urban zones, you know, as a way of categorizing, you know, specific neighborhoods and, and, uh, and how, you know, police is implemented. So I think this is interesting on how and I think this is very important because even within the progressive forces, the focus is so much on these issues of the extreme right of, that is instead of, okay, let's talk about this, but let's connect. So I think that the struggle is usually uh, has been, no usually has been often to try to connect both. But I, so I think that is, uh, what are the solutions? I think we need to, but this is, I know this is not a very probably welcome uh, thing, but I think that we need to stop with the training, honestly, because it's, it's going nowhere. And actually, for instance, when, when, when I did some research, we did the research on, on, on the implementation of, of anti-discrimination legislation in law, and, the, and we focus a lot on, the, on, e, on um, cases of police brutality. And we interviewed, for instance, police officers uh, regarding the, uh, the their curricula, and we're, we're talking more, you know, like uh, the, the training, you know, in higher rank uh, offices, for some of them that they're going to do like even masters, you know, in, in police science, you know. They have a lot of training on human rights. They have constitutional law. There is not really such a lack in itself, you know. And I think we are, we and I, I think that we need to, to overcome this, this, this divide, this constant divide, I think then again, we need to overcome this idea that racism is about ignorance of the other. I think this is a persistent understanding. And it's more about the kind of knowledge we are, we are all the time producing and how we are trained to, to think. So I think that one of the, uh, um, for me of the, the big challenges is again to, to connect these two issues and to end here, another thing that I think is very important is that we know that, I mean, liberal law, how, for instance, specifically criminal law, is very, is very difficult to overcome that because, you know, how, how the law proceeds, we know that. But I think at the same time, something that we need to do is to push the agenda uh, further within the, the justice system, you know, public prosecutor, judges, that, like for instance, there for instance, there in my in my to my knowledge, what I've seen is like there is there is no dialogue, you know, in jurisprudence. There is not there has not been a development of legal thinking about races and anti-racist. I think this is really lacking. Uh, and of course, you know, in the academia, you know, but really, you know, like yeah, in, in jurisprudence, it's, it's it's really limited. Uh and there is no interrelation, you know, what is for instance at the level of of the European Court of Human Rights, you know, that usually always refer to what is the, the national legislation, of course, what had been the implementation of the racial equality directive, but there is no, yeah, there is very, very little um, dialogue there. Yeah, sorry for the long. No, it's okay. Um, Karen <laughs> has joined us, so I want to give uh, Dr. Austin a chance to respond, and then we're going to ask Karen Taylor to, to speak to us. Yeah, I'll be really brief. I think the problem is in, in, in both the US and in Europe is that, first of all, we have to question, as I mentioned in my presentation, 
are we going to continue to have discussion, honest discussions about race? Because it seems that, especially in America, we only talk about race when something really horrible has happened, when someone has been murdered because of the police or something really terrible has happened. But we don't talk about the need to change uh, the the effects of the historical discrimination in our society. For example, I've been doing a lot of reading about historically black colleges and universities and how they're severely underfunded. That is something that is a legacy that's been around for a long, long time. That's an example of racism, how they don't have the resources that we take for granted at UF. Um, and so that's just one example. And then also we talk a lot about policing, housing, um, schools, uh, the fact that a lot of children are going to school and they're not getting a proper education and that's gonna have major implications for every aspect of their lives as they get older. Those are also race related issues that we don't have honest discussions about. And so we need to continue to, to have discussions um, based on what happened with George Floyd, but we need to continue those discussions and be truthful about the reasons certain things are the way they are in, in some societies. Okay, thank you very much. And now with some delay and, and, and a bit of careful onboarding and offboarding of trains, uh, Karen, are you able to speak to us? It's okay if you can't use your video. Uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? We can. Oh, that, that's wonderful. I'm stranded somewhere here in, um, I don't know which part of Germany. I'm actually <laughs> on my train back home, but I left that train so I can at least use my connection um, from my phone to, to talk to you. So first of all, thank you so much for the, for the invitation. I'm really, well, I was really looking forward to having this conversation with you because I believe, um, First of all, looking at both sides, the, the European and the American side, but also then joining forces um, can be very beneficial for both sides. I, from my experience at INAR, at the European Network Against Racism, um, we've really benefited from a lot of um, alliances and coalitions we've built with them. Um, yeah, our, our brothers and sisters, I can say, from, from, from the US, and especially looking at the initiatives that civil society can take. Um, and I think vice versa, it, it, it was the same. So thank you so much for, yeah, for, for bringing us together. I wanted, unfortunately, I didn't hear um, all of the presentations, but what I hope to bring you to the discussion is to first talk about the EU framework and especially addressing the patchwork manner and the, and, and yeah, the issues that come with the patchwork manner of the EU legis uh, le legislation. Um, I would also like to talk about the gaps that um, yeah are developed or the gaps that um, result out of this patchwork of the legal frameworks. And if I have the time um, to also look at the development and especially with the national action plan. Um, Again, the, the, the action plan against racism, the Arab, um, how the discussions since 2020, the murder of George Floyd, went on in the uh, in in Europe. So, um, starting with the patchwork of racial equality framework, um, the EU legislative and policy responses to racism can be characterized as yeah, as I said, patchwork in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, the EU has responded to the rising racism and racial inequality with a legal and policy framework focused on singular individual acts of discrimination or racist violence by foregrounding the use of the criminal law and individual sanctions for incidents of racism and discrimination. The European Union has foregrounded as an individualized and, and reactive approach to racism. And I would say that is the main issue um, that, that exists with this legal patchwork. Yet racism understood as a structural phenomenon, and I got that first part of, of the discussion here, um, is primarily about the position of racialized people and communities vis-a-vis -vis states, institutions, and corporations. So that is clear. And structural racism points to the structure that create and maintain vulnerability, harms, and precarity 
aligned to racial difference. It is the relationship between historical injustices, epistemic knowledge, eraser, laws, institutions, policies, practices, and social, political, and e economical disparities. Structure racism engenders a state of constructed vulnerability to ongoing state of violence or to premature death rather than a reactive individual focus addressing structure racism necessities um, attention to the systems. So secondly, whilst the EU implemented horizontal measures in the form of the two equality directives in 2000, the institutions have since implemented a series of policy measures and institutional appointments addressing particular racialized communities, such as the appointment of the coordinated coordinators for some communities and here I have to stress on some communities as for example there's no coordinator um, for the community of people of African descent uh, which also has been contested uh, by civil society. So this siloed approach to anti-racism policy at the institutional level has directed resources to addressing racial inequality experienced by some singularly defined communities to the exclusion of others. One result of this policy choice has been the erasure of, of some racialized communities within the legal frameworks, and in particular, the erasure of those at the intersection between these forms of racism and other forms of discrimination. For example, in terms of racialized communities, the current institutional framework has no or lesser specific reference to people of African descent, Middle Eastern, Arab, Asian, and Latin American communities, all of whom experience structural racism in, in Europe. There's no question about that. Uh, um, the data of um, the Fundamental Rights Agency um, in Europe shows that these are groups that face racism, and yet um, there is a lack, um, and I will get to the to the gaps uh, further on. Further, it is unclear how individuals who belong to multiple racialized communities, such as, for example, a Black Jewish person, particular as anti-Semitism and racism, fall under the remit of two separate European commissioners, or at the intersection with other forms of discrimination, such as queer Romani people, are accommodated under the EU's fragmented framework. So this siloing of anti-racism policy has affected the potential impact of EU policy. The variegated level of recognition within the European Commission's organizational structure has created competition amongst communities. And I say that um, because Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the European um, Network Against Racism, where we uh, uh, gather a range of communities under our umbrella, but we see in the different discussions that the communities even have within our organization, um, that is difficult for us, um, and we used to work like that in the past, it's difficult for us uh, to, to, to look at the broader picture or to, to address um, the the, more the commonalities rather than focusing on individual groups, but because the policy, the EU policy um, is, is giving that framework, uh, the, the communities, especially the civil society organizations that work on it, try to follow the same pattern, which then um, yeah, creates barriers for a fruitful cooperation to actually work together. Um, so amongst civil society, this has necessitated advocacy, understandably directed at addressing the invisibility of certain groups and policies, such as through events such as um, the EU Week for People of African Descent, for example, that we hosted in the European Parliament in 2018. Yet the shift towards recognition focused political advocacy has obscured the importance of issue-based coalition building and advocacy on aspects of racism of common concern to all racialized communities, such as uh, racial profiling, police brutality, punitive border practices, 
and discrimination in the housing market. Thirdly, issues of racial equality and racism have been primarily confined to units of the European Commission focused on non-discrimination and hate crimes. This has made the EU framework generally ill-equipped to address institutional structural and the root causes of racism. And this leaves significant gaps to address structural racism that manifests in other policy areas such as law enforcement, migration and climate and env environmental policies. With respect to law enforcement, the current EU framework makes provisions for acts of racist violence committed by a member of the public, but not by a member of state law enforcement. Then we have the context of migration. There is a minimal scope to address the intersection with racism. Racism and structural exclusion initiated and maintained by EU migration policy is for the most part deemed beyond the remit of EU official responsible for racism because migration is located in another direct role general. Um, if I look at further gaps, um, we have the gap that discrimination um, in the field of law enforcement is missing despite the wide range um, legal framework on racial discrimination, the protection against racism in law enforcement is out of the scope of the EU race directive. Um, the majority of EU policy under the rubric of racism and xenophobia is geared towards methods of combating interpersonal racist violence, not committed by law enforcement officers, through the means of criminal law, such as the EU approach has left a major gap in terms of legal protection of race, racialized people when discriminated by law enforcement and officials um, and the criminal justice system as such. I mentioned uh, the gap of um, in the context of migration um, management and the border control as well. So examples of racial discrimination at borders are increasing and and enabled a lack of legal protection against discrimination on the grounds. I guess this um, has also been fairly covered by the media. So this is not, it's, it's, it's not actually not a black box. We, we know about this gap. Um, then I already mentioned the intersectional justice um, and discrimination gap. So the, the, the silos, so I'm, I'm jumping just through um, to go to, um, which developments we've seen in order to address these issues. Um, on September 16, 2020, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, she delivered a speech with a pledge of effectively addressing racism in Europe. Um, I guess this was a momentum also for civil society um, to see this policy been addressed at this stage uh, for, for the very first time. And through the EU anti-racism action plan, the EU Arab, the European Commission signaled its intention to seriously combat racism through a series of proposed measures. However, the negligible amount of progress made over the last two years reveals, just a second, Uh oh, um, gosh, that was a, a wonderful conversation, um, but technology is not always what it's cracked up to be. Um, we have had a number of questions and there's been some good conversations in the q and I'm wondering if either of you two would like to take any of those questions that you've already discussed um, from that and um, maybe address them, talk about them openly because all the other participants can't see the the Q&A questions. Um, I think there were uh, some of the interesting ones were um, what it would look like to focus on institutional racism. What, what would we see uh, if that were to be the case? Um, and I would be interested myself in, um, in thinking about how the EU and, um, you know, Sharon, I know this isn't your expertise, but 
how it would work if um, if there was an attempt to try to engage with um, anti-racist legislation, given the diversity of the EU member states. Okay, can you say the question one more time? Asking here, because Karen's texting me. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the, the question that was in the Q&A, asking about what institutional racism would look like, maybe we can just start with that. What, uh -huh. how, do you, how could you envision it being manifest, right? All of us have, you know, seen the hiring of DEI folks in institutions and training to help people to recognize racism and microaggressions, so overt and covert racism. But what would it look like to try to address the institutional embeddedness? You know, you mentioned the HBCUs here in the US, just having a base level of funding that is so much less. And that of course has knock-on effects or home ownership in the US. And I'm sure there are similar um similar variables or categories where disparities between different racial groups have been embedded so deeply that it's very difficult to find um, a clear solution uh, for how to address those institutionalized differences. So yeah. just some discussion of, a short discussion because Karen's trying to join us, okay. what, that, uh, what that might look like. All right, I'll be as brief as possible. The one thing I wanna say, especially to the students who are here, if you could take my urban politics class. <laughs> I know I saw a couple of you uh, who have taken my uh, class be classes before in urban politics and community analysis, because we talk about just uh, some of the issues with housing, um, especially like gentrification. You have communities that once, in many cases, there were predominantly black neighborhoods that were working class, middle class, viable neighborhoods. Uh, and then during the era of integration, when black people who are middle class moved out of these communities, they then fell into a lot of problems with poverty. And then you had, especially in the 1980s, the drug epidemic. Uh, and then you had situations where now we have mass incarceration because of the some of the legislation of the 1990s that was designed to try to make cities safer and to try to address drug trafficking and other kinds of uh, problems associated with crime. And so a lot of that feeds into institutional racism in the sense that when you think about some of those neighborhoods now that were the poor neighborhoods, when everyone had left, they were completely abandoned. Uh, there were no businesses there. there. The schools were substandard. They had the highest crime rates in cities. And then they later were gentrified. And so that meant that people came in, developers brought land for a cheaper price. They built high rises, they built upscale housing, they put in restaurants and different things to try to get upper, upper middle class or middle class people to move back in. And that worked in a lot of cities. But the problem is that a lot of the people who had always lived in those communities who were disproportionately black, disproportionately poor, and also disproportionately elderly ended up getting priced out because now it's so expensive in these communities that they can no longer afford to live there. So I see that as an example of institutional racism. There already was a lot of racism. These are people who, who had uh, family members who lived in the era of segregation and then all these other changes occurred and now they're being priced out of these communities. And I notice even when I go to Paris, uh, the same thing is happening in cities in, in Europe as well. Uh, a lot of the areas that we travel to when I take my class there that will, you know, especially this one neighborhood that has a nickname of Little Africa, uh, it has a lot of the same thing going on. They're, they're gentrifying those communities. A lot of people are being forced out. So you're seeing the same type of racial dynamics, um, but a lot of people don't like to talk about institutional racism. And when we talk about individual racism, we can acknowledge that some people have these horrible views or say and do horrible things, but we don't wanna talk about the fact that in our society as a whole, there's been institutional racism that has been society-wide discrimination. And that's what a lot of people in America don't want to talk about. And the same thing is true in Europe as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so I was replying to this yeah, very interesting question. Um, and I want to pick up on, on what I was, I, will, I read, I wrote, sorry, in the chat. So I think that, um, yeah, I would like to see that how it would look, uh, how Europe would look like if we we will really have a like institutional races would be at the center of our discussion. And but I think that we need to also to have like a conceptual discussion and is and to be aware of what is the history of this notion and why. For instance, it's very interesting to to um, to remember that uh, when the, the racial equality directive was under discussion in the European Parliament, 
Some of the recommendations, you know, uh, before the final draft that was approved, uh, some of the recommendations by the European Parliament was precisely to include the notion of institutional races, but this was not the case. It was not included. And I don't want to fetishize, you know, like institutional race is the concept. I think the reluctance, of, for instance, if you, if you um, we look at this history of this concept, for instance, in the UK, and we need to remember, for instance, what happened with the Stephen Lawrence case, also related to extreme right, uh, extreme right uh, violence and the and the killing of Stephen Lawrence. But institutional racism again was was a concept that resurfaced uh, to deal with the uh, uh, um, how how police handled this case, you know, and uh, or basically how they did not. But I what I wanted to say is that. Institutional racism has, as a concept has a very specific history linked to radical black thinking. And it has been very, at the center of grassroots uh, anti-racist movements, and all, of course in the United States, but also in the UK. So that's why, for instance, there is a preference for a structural racism, which I think it's a very important uh, also notion, but I think usually it's incorporated in a way of uh, let's say, like, to diffuse, like, you know, yeah, race has, is a structural, you know, it's everywhere or has a very long history, but you, you cannot really, okay, but for instance, when we're talking about education, when we're talking about policing, when we're talking about residential segregation, where are the specific policies, where are the specific decisions being made? So I think that what, what, what I was uh, responding on, on, on the chat was that Institutional races from the, if we take the concept from the, from the black radical tradition and, and specifically from the black power framework, it's a concept that wants, what wants to, to foreground is the permanence of a colonial relation and the centrality of, of the state. I mean, I know it's very complex, you know, what is the state, but the state of public and, and, uh, and, uh, and private interest, you know, capital, et cetera. So what I think is like what the conversation will look like is that the states will have to confront themselves. Um, and for instance, we will have to have made probably honest conversation about whiteness and yeah, white supremacy, which in Europe, of course, no. <laughs> you know, white, it's, it's, there are notions that are really, uh, yeah, they, they don't want to be really uh, on the table, no? So I think what it will look like is that you will have a more, you, you will need to move beyond reform. That's one of the key issues, you know. Uh, and I think that I was also uh, writing that in the, in the chat is that, for instance, there is a lot of now of discussion uh, coming also from, from, from the black radical tradition and, and with the notion of anti-blackness as different, in a sense, different to, to anti-Black races, that says that there is a very specific limit even on anti-racist, because it's very, at the end of the day, it's very focused on, on the state rationale of reform, you know? So even if we acknowledge institutional racism, there will be always an acknowledgement that falls prey of this in the gain of this individualization. Like at the end, it will be like, ah, well, there are individuals in institutions that <laughs> that deviate from the principles. So you know, like, yeah, sorry for the <laughs> circulation of, but I think like, yeah, there's what it will look like is like a kind of com of confrontation with with yourself, you know, in terms of, of the state and whiteness. And that, that is something that is, I don't think, I think it's off the table in, in Europe. Thank you. Um, I, I I think we may have lost Karen, so uh, I'm gonna. There are a couple more questions in the in the Q and A that um, I wanted uh, to to ask you folks to consider. And um, we have one from Akasemi Newsom, who, after some very kind words, asks about whether or not um, there have either of you know about any institutional policy efforts within the EU to address what if appears to be actually a form of racism in the EU institutions itself in, in, in terms of just the virtual absence of EU citizens of color as either employees or elected officials within EU bodies and offices. Um, and this has become even more the case um, with, uh, with Brexit. So I didn't know if um, maybe um, 
Sylvia, you have any uh, ideas about the extent to which that's even been discussed in the EU context? Because it is quite noticeable. Uh, yeah, I, I really don't, I mean, I, I cannot give really a very yeah uh, serious, really rigorous answer because I haven't really done the, the work, you know, like I'm not aware of that, but I think that maybe a, a, an interesting way to um, to open the discussion from that, that question is that also how issues about affirmative action has been also very difficult to parry, you know, which I think they, they relate also to, to different kind of, of, of bodies, you know, public bodies also politically, you know, in the parliament, like the idea of, even for instance, when, when since the seventies, mostly uh, the discussion about the gender gap, you know, in, 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 in labor and also the lack of participation of, of women, of course, we know that what was, the idea that with women we were talking about we know what kind of women mostly you know like like middle class white women and, and their the incorporation in uh, in the labor market this was a discussion you know just a question of parity and having specific policies you know but i think that regarding with race and ethnicity again i think this is a very difficult conversation so i i that's what will be like i think that this question also of affirmative action policy that again links to the question of institutionalization i think this is again one of the big elephants in the room also in the european context you know? okay karen has managed to come back to us i think <laughs> I really appreciate the struggle, uh, even yes, after fantastic. all of these years, the, the technology is what it is. I don't know if ah. you had finished your planned comments. Um, we also have a question that you might be able to contribute to. Uh, what would your preference be? Yeah, then maybe we'll start with the question and then I'll, I'll finish the, the okay. presentation. Okay, the, the question uh, which was just being addressed by, by Sylvia is, um, whether or not there have been any institutional policy efforts actually within the EU institutions to address what is essentially the virtual absence of EU citizens of color as employees and or elected officials within EU bodies and offices in Brussels. Yes, this is part of the Arab, the action, the action plan against racism mm -hmm. to first and um, I believe the um, uh, high representative, uh, representative um, against racism she has started to uh, she has started with this um, a survey within um, the workers of the EU institutions especially the commission um, this is based on 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 a free participation of the employees and it's uh, very much also connected to the question of equality data so this has been ongoing. Um, I don't know when the results are to to come out, but with this first step, seeing of who is actually working within the institution and what are the experience that they're making, um, the next step would then be coming up with what we hope quotas um, for for um, yeah the, the the civil the EU civil servants. So. Um, what we see now is that at least the issue has been seen, it's been addressed, there have been campaigns also from civil society driven campaigns, uh, Brussels so white, for example, um, and, and the commission, this commission's president herself, Ursula von der Leyen, she addressed that um, in her State of the Union in 2021, I believe, if I'm not yeah, 2021. Um, so it's not only been discussed um, within civil society, but within the institutions itself. But so far, there is no legislation um, on the table yet to actually change that state. But as, as I said, for me, um, the, the first step is seeing who's actually within the institutions. And this has been seen within um, yeah, the, the, the representative against racism, Mikaela Mir, who, who started this. Uh, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, it's extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, I, we have gone to a, about, a, we have gone to about an hour uh, and 15 minutes. I, I don't know if anyone had uh, any closing comments that they, that they wanted to give. Uh, I appreciate everyone's patience as we've meandered a bit uh in a, in a somewhat less organized and structured way than we than we would have 
I want to just give an opportunity to to Karen, but also to our other speakers, if there's anything that you'd like to to say before we close. Or not. I just want to say uh, thank you um, the, for inviting me, and uh, yeah, I always enjoy working with uh, Center for European Studies. And thank you to the people who came today, the participants, um, because I know it's a really busy time of the semester. So thank you all for for this conversation. Okay. Uh, anyone else? If not, I. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, not yet, Karen. Do you want to jump in? Okay. No, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. That was, um, yeah, uh, even though I didn't get all of it, but I will see it online. So <laughs> thank that's you right. For that's the, the beauty of recording. Mm -hmm. No, the same. I mean, I really like, would like to thank. Uh, it was very, very, very interesting. I love, of course, discussing these, these issues. And yeah, sorry for other questions that I know we haven't had the time to, to, to discuss. But well, maybe we need a, another round <laughs> in the yes, future. Yes, <laughs> uh, maybe from now, maybe from now on, I'll go back to in person. Um, <laughs> thank you all uh, so much. Uh, we really appreciate you. It, it is a difficult time. We've had we we worked on on scheduling and avoiding uh, conflicts. So I do appreciate folks coming in this close to the holidays. I hope that everyone has a great holiday, uh, and I appreciate the the attendees as well. I think we managed to get to most questions either. Um, online or in the written comments. So I do think that most people got their questions discussed. And it is certainly a topic that requires an additional discussion on both sides of the Atlantic. So I don't think that this will be the end. So again, thank you, everyone. And um, there is a survey when you, for their attendees, as you leave, you have to virtually walk through a survey. So we would really appreciate it if you could just complete that survey for us. It helps us to plan for other events and find ways to meet the interests and demands of those who are our audience. So once again, thank you. I hope everyone has a restful, peaceful, equitable uh, holiday. Mm. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>